Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to uh, present a question and answer session that came from a presentation I gave uh, to the uh, Venus Lymphatic World International Network. And this was a, a particular module targeted to people and general practitioners from Central America and West Indies. This tremendous organization uh, of the uh, Venus Lymphatic World International Network has reached out around the world and scheduled these presentations. And my presentation was regarding this logo you see here, never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. Now, what is that all about? Well, what that means is that when you meet someone, you must interrogate them with a thorough history and physical. So they become like your friend. And then, of course, you would never treat a stranger without doing the interrogation. And once you interrogate them, you would apply, apply the proper thrombosis prophylaxis in order to prevent that patient from having a serious or fatal event. And Dr. Maxime Shatikov was asked to discuss my presentation regarding this. And I am answering uh, the questions that were posed as a result of his discussion. If you watch this video, it will give you a deep dive into some more uh, evaluation and how to really perform risk assessment, some of the more subtle details. So I hope you enjoy this and enjoy the video uh, that follows. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very sorry not to be doing this live, but due to scheduling difficulties, that's not possible. I'd like to thank Maxime Shatikov for his excellent questions. And uh, he raises some very important points uh, regarding the score and also uh, regarding uh, the uh, pneumatic compression devices. I will respond to the, uh, to the score <clears throat> given the time constraints. And first of all, I'd like to talk about the barriers to obtaining the score. Uh, the unfortunately, Collecting and recording 40 risk factors is a daunting task. And the pre-surgical holding area is the wrong environment. The nurses that are empowered there are trying to make sure that you're having the right procedure done for the right reasons at the right time, um, on the right extremity, if you will, and that all your labs are in place. It's no time to be asking about a family history of thrombosis. And, and yet that is done all the time. Another time where it's inappropriate is in the, when you're interviewing the surgeon and the surgeon's explaining to you why you have to have the surgery. You're not interested in your telling about your past history of thrombosis. You're more interested in how long is this surgery going to last? Am I going to be, how long am I going to be out of work? Am I really going to be back to normal? What could go wrong? <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is not, again, the right place to, to ask these questions. And, and when the patients get admitted, to, to throw this task on the floor nurses who are already doing too many things, and they're not specifically trained in performing a history and physical, that's inappropriate. On the other hand, people that are taking the history, not ex understanding the importance of obstetrical complications. I remember recently, I was at a, a morbidity mortality conference and this patient had a clot and I raised my hand and I said, what's the patient's obstetrical history? And the, uh, the, 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 head, the head of the conference turned around and said, Joe, we're not, this patient's not having a baby. We're trying to uh, operate on her for cancer. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. That history in the past may mean that she's carrying a marker of thrombophilia. And so this is another difficult point to get across. And it's in no other risk assessment that I know of. And the other thing is obtaining a proper family history of thrombosis on the fly. Normally, when you ask people about their families, they say, oh, everything is fine. You've got to really dig in to get the proper family history. And then there's the other problem, which we still have with the orthopedists, that they don't really believe in all the traditional risk factors that we have in all the other specialties and are, are challenging, us, challenging us to prove it in orthopedic patients, especially total joint replacement. Now to continue on, the guidelines haven't helped us. CHESS 2012 at that time did a marvelous job suggesting for the first time that individual risk assessment could be used, but 
uh, talked about two scores and the Roger score uh, was only done in one publication. And since that time, it's shown to be not really that valid, especially in trauma patients. And uh, the, the Caprini score, which at that time had a number of studies, uh, that was very good. But they, they, they said that patients who had a score of five or more had a 6% chance of getting a blood clot if they didn't have prophylaxis. Now that may have been true based on what they looked at at the time, but that's certainly not true now. For example, patients with head and neck surgery who have a score of five, very few of them, if any of them get a clot, but if it's over eight, then 18% uh, in one, one particular series get a clot. So that the set point is different for different surgical specialties. And uh, this problem was compounded in 2019 when ASH, the surgical guidelines, failed to discuss any of this. They have only one uh, Caprini score article and it's the original 2005 article. The more than 150 publications from all of you wonderful people from all around the world, and I'd like to stop and acknowledge that. The, my friends around the world in five continents have done the enormous bulk of the work to show that this is a valid and very useful score. And yet that wasn't included, including a nice meta-analysis that was done in 2017. So we're not getting any help there. And the next problem is that we, there's, no, there's no individual risk assessment in most randomized controlled trials. They just put everybody in the same bucket, everybody in the same shoe. And the classic example is with COVID-19 and all of those patients, should they get prophylactic anticoagulation, therapeutic anticoagulation, but they're all in the same bucket. And so if, to say that high risk patients in ICU on respirators shouldn't get therapeutic anticoagulation may not be right because well, although overall, it may be true, but if those people have extra high risk factors, then maybe they merit prophylaxis. So that's another problem we have. Now, where do we go from here? First of all, the score should be embedded into the electronic medical record uh, and also linked to clinical pathways. Now you must assign the healthcare provider responsible for collecting the admitting history and physical to score the patient. It has to be a person that's trained in taking histories and physicals. The score has to be updated during hospitalization and calculating the final, fi the final score at discharge, providing continued for prophylaxis. Providing continued prophylaxis for those at risk is very, very important. And shown again by Professor Arcellus in the Riete database, most patients that get the clot get it once they go home. Provide patient-friendly version uh, of the document of, of the risk assessment on the patient portal. When I go in for an exam, if I have an exam scheduled at the hospital, I'll get this email and I have to go onto the portal ahead of time and put in all my insurance information, my allergies, my medications to pre-register for the visit. Well, what about doing a score at that time if you're gonna have surgery? Another thing is you need to require mandatory prophylactic compliance with the care pathways that are set up Boston and Michigan have excellent care pathways set up and based on the level of risk prophylaxis is given for a period of time. And the pathways have to be geared to set points for surgical specialties. It's not everybody over five, that's, that's inappropriate. A score of five, everybody that has a total hip has a score of five to start with. So what we found is the set point in total hip replacement is 10. If it's 10 or above, traditional anticoagulants are useful. If it's, not, if it's below 10, then aspirin works very, very well. And then one needs to correlate the 90-day clinical VTE rates with the score results. Now, future endeavors. How do we improve this situation? First of all, I've decided to donate the, the score to the American Venus Forum for a future version called the AVF Caprini score. And there are five subcommittees from people around the world looking at revisiting existing risk factors, identifying new risk factors, and defining each risk factor. We know there's a lot of new risk factors that are not in the score, particularly things like uh, sleep apnea and uh, uh, abdominoplasty is one that uh, needs to be uh, specifically uh, added to the score because that's a higher risk. And there are a number of other things, diabetes requiring insulin, blood transfusions, smoking aids, and so forth. Now we have a very interesting project going and the first results 
um, of, of this uh, of, of this project, we hope will will create a interview by the computer uh, to collect the risk assessment using phone. So if you're going to have a visit to the doctor, you can call up this number and they, the score, they will ask you the score over the phone. Just like when you call up the bank or call up a company, they, they go through these menus. Now, another thing that we've discovered, which is a secret, secret sort of a, a finding, was that we're involved with the Global Thrombosis Forum. And the Global Thrombosis Forum is a, uh, is a, is a, is a dedicated 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the knowledge of science among young people, especially from, from underdeveloped countries. And so we have people from all over the world, uh, they're high school students and we're empowering them to learn more about science. And they did a recent project uh, using the, the risk score and they gave it uh, to their friends and classmates with appropriate approval. And in one month, they got 1500 responses back from these, these uh, uh, students and their families with a very high incidence of a, a family history of thrombosis in the respondents. And that was because the families huddled together to try to help the students with their homework to get a good mark. And so while that may have been biased, it was biased in a good sense because you collect good data. Taking that data then and putting it into the electronic medical record of the patient after verifying with the doctor is going to be one of the ways that we can improve this. And if high schools all over the world did this, we would really be able to get much better data. And I'd encourage you also all to go to the International Society of Hemostasis and Thrombosis annual meeting with the poster session coming up in the next week or 10 days. And you will see our poster with annotations uh, uh, throughout. It's a very interesting project. Then once we get the new score from the subcommittees, this score will have to be prospectively validated comparing the new and the old scores. And we're very lucky because we have all of these good friends around the world that are, uh, will be willing to test this new uh, score compared to the old score. And then the other thing that's really, really key will be the incorporation of machine learning tools. And I'd like to em em emphasize that a little bit. We know that using the computer, you can fly an airplane, you can assist driving a car. Well, we also know that putting enough information into the EM from the EMR, you can create a diagnostic algorithms. And this has already been done both in the United States and, and China and elsewhere to predict a diag diagnostic algorithm that will predict VTE incidents. And so you have to train the computer though. You put the data in from the EMR and then you do prospective 90 day results. And based on those results and what the EMR, uh, uh, what the machine learning tool estimated, you compare those two estimates and using feedback from actual results, improve the accuracy of the machine learning tool. And then finally, and we're very excited about this, the International Society of Hemostasis and Thrombosis in their committees We'll take a look at all of the results that we're doing and eventually prepare a document that will outline the sort of the good, the bad and the ugly about the new Caprini score and how that can be used uh, in everyday clinical practice. So I thank you all uh, for listening to this again. I'm sorry I'm not there in person and I congratulate all the, uh, the people around the world that have contributed to this project. Thank you very much everyone and you all have a great day.